Okay, if you could join me in turning, please, to the book of Revelation and the 12th chapter, Revelation chapter 12. I'm going to take time and read the entire chapter, 17 verses, and we're going to be considering war in heaven of all places, war in heaven. And so it says in verse 1, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars and she being with child cried travailing in birth and pained to be delivered and there appeared another wonder in heaven and behold a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast upon the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and a half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the great dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And again, God blesses the reading of his precious word. So just a little bit of background and information that's important as we begin today. First of all, uh, prior to the seven last plagues, we're now about to enter into yet another little parenthetical section. And in this particular parenthetical section which is going to encompass chapters 12 through 14 we're going to be considering the seven great personalities of the end times and particularly the seven great personalities that are going to come to particular prominence during the last three and a half years of the tribulation period what we might call the main players who they are what is their significance and if you remember our little analogy, we, we kind of use it like teaching a uh, maybe a unit study 
on the Civil War and uh, the American Civil War. And as we were teaching this study, we would look at the, the chronological sequence of events. So we get that in Revelation when we look at the, the seals, uh, the trumpets, and then the final bowl judgments. That gives you the chronological framework. But along the way, we, we stop and do some kind of side studies. And so we've stopped and we've asked the question, well, who can ever be saved? We've only just seen the seals and, and it, it, it's already devastated a lot of people. Is anybody going to survive this? And so we stopped and we looked at the great number that are going to be saved, the 144,000 and then that great multitude that nobody can number. And then we looked at some of the main places, just like you would if you were studying the Civil War. You'd look at places uh, like Fort Sumter, uh, Bull Run. You'd look at uh, Andersonville, some of those places in, the, in terms of the geography. You'd look at some of those places. And then you'd look at some of the key personalities. You'd look at uh, Stonewall Jackson, and Robert E. Lee, and and uh, uh, Grant and Sherman and some of the key and Abraham Lincoln. And so that's what we're doing now is we're stopping and we're looking at some of the great personalities to help us understand kind of all the events that are taking place at this time. So I'm going to kind of list the seven great personalities. Five of them we're going to be encountering in chapter 12. And then two of them we're going to see in chapter 13. And so we'll just run down them quickly. We're going to look at them in more detail. But in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 12, we begin with this woman clothed with the sun. And we're going to find out who is this woman clothed with the sun. I'm going to suggest to you right now up ahead, I'm going to give my put my cards on the deck. I believe it's Israel. I'm going to explain why it's Israel. But certainly Israel is going to be very prominent in the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. And so certainly that is who we're going to see in chapter 12, 1 and 2. And then, of course, this red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. And, of course, that is the red dragon. We know who that is. It tells us clearly in the text. And that's verses 3 and 4. It's Satan. And uh, it explains it. Verse 9, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. Certainly he is going to be very active at that time. And then there's this male child who's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. Uh, we get introduced to him in verse 5 and 6. Uh, she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Of course, we believe that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in verse 7 through 12, we're going to look at Michael, the archangel. That's where we're going to see that section where Satan is cast out of heaven. But it will be Michael, the archangel, who and his angels who will accomplish this task. And we're going to find out from the book of Daniel that he has a great significant role to play in the end times and especially in connection with Israel. And then a fifth uh, personality or uh, group we're going to be looking at is um, the offspring of the woman. We're going to see that verses 13 through 17, uh, who is going to be persecuted by the dragon. And of course, we've already seen Israel, but there's some other group here that is going to be in focus. We're going to see that other group in verse 17, and it's the tribulation saints who are going to suffer greatly. Verse 17 says the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandment of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And then we go into chapter 13, and we're going to see the sixth and seventh great personalities in verses 1 through 10, the beast out of the sea, which we're going to call the man of sin. And uh, we're going to suggest the Antichrist. Uh, we're going to hopefully show why we believe that that is the Antichrist when we get there next week. And then the beast out of the earth, verse 11 through 18, that is the false prophet who we're also are going to look at. So these are going to be the seven key personages that we're going to witness in the tribulation period, especially the last three and a half years. As we consider the sun-clothed woman, maybe just an aside here, this is a great chapter for people who like alliteration, uh, because a lot of W's in this chapter. Uh, for instance, you've got this great wonder in heaven, and then you've got the woman, and then in verse 7, you've got a war, 
And then in verse 12, you have a woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. And then you got wings uh, being carried by wings of an eagle in verse 14. And they're carried by wings of an eagle into the wilderness, for, again, verse 14. And then out of the mouth comes water from the serpent to try and destroy them. So this is a, a guys who love alliteration. They can have a lot of fun in, <clears throat> in chapter 12 of Revelation. In this chapter, one of the things we're going to see is the intensity of Satan's malice towards Israel. And then at the same time, we're going to see God's love and preservation and care for them. Uh, we, we all know that anti-Semiticism has gone on throughout uh, human history, <laughs> but we're going to see it's going to reach a pinnacle during that last three and a half year period and we're going to see his incredible satan behind it all his incredible malice towards the nation of israel we're also going to observe something very significant in this chapter and that is this that satan is the ultimate loser and he fails in all that he attempts to do and as we go through the chapter, we want to. Uh, this is why uh, this chapter is so significant. It reveals what a loser he really is, and we're going to highlight that as we go along. Now, of course, we do say that this chapter there's some highly figurative language, but actually, despite the figurative language, the teaching is very clear and straightforward. And remember, we've said that so often when we we're, we're kind of confronted with symbolism in the scriptures and this symbolic language. Usually, when it comes to the book of Revelation, those symbols are interpreted either from elsewhere in the book, and we're going to see that as we proceed today, or that they're, they're interpreted elsewhere in scripture. But it's, it's very easy to get an explanation uh, from elsewhere in the word of God where these symbols are explained. So we want to try to understand the identity of this woman in the opening verses. And um, so uh, let's just again read verse one and two. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. She being with child cried travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. Let me just say this. There are various views that have been put forward as to her identity over the years. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church would have us believe that this is Mary, the Queen of Heaven. And uh, some of us who were raised in that system will remember seeing pictures uh, of, of Mary, you know, kind of clothed with the sun and the moon and stars and all the rest of it. And we, uh, and again, crowned as the queen of heaven. And so that's, this would be the Catholic view of it. Now, part of the difficulty with seeing Mary here is that um, she's travailing in childbirth here. I want you to notice that. Verse two, she being with child cried travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. Now, here's a real difficulty for Roman Catholic scholars, and that is this, that according to Rome, she, she was conceived without the stain of original sin. So, so they, they believe that um, she, she was sinless. Now, part of the difficulty is this, that actual pain in childbirth is a direct result of God's judgment on sin and what we call the curse. Now, if she was without sin, why would she indeed be subject to the curse uh, which is pronounced? Look at Genesis chapter 3 uh, concerning childbearing. And part of the curse is laid out quite clearly as the travail in giving birth. And so it says, verse 16, unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband. He shall rule over thee. And so again, that seems to eliminate Mary. And 
uh, we'll explain what the travail in giving birth is all about in a moment. But just want you to say that that's, that's a view that is held by the Roman Catholic Church. Another interesting view, which you might find fascinating, is that Christian science, uh, the founder of Christian science, which is, by the way, neither Christian nor scientific, but uh, Mary Baker Eddy claimed that she was the woman and the man-child she gave birth to was Christian science, and the dragon being the mortal mind, which is antagonistic to her teaching. Well, again, the Bible tells us clearly who the dragon is, <laughs> and it's that old serpent, the devil. It's not the mortal mind at all. So, again, just to show you that there's lots of different views. Um, so, some have even uh, have uh, true believers have even suggested that the woman is a picture of the church in travail, bringing Christ to the nations. But the truth is that the church did not produce Christ, but Christ produced the church. <laughs> I will build my church, right? It's based on his shed blood. So again, utter nonsense, but nevertheless, sincere Christians hold to that view. So how are we to find the true identity of this woman who brings forth the man-child? Again, we said symbolism is usually interpreted somewhere else in the Bible. So I'd like us to go again to the book of Genesis in chapter 37. And Genesis 37, the story of Joseph. And here we're going to be looking at one of his dreams. And he says in verse 9 of Genesis 37, and he dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren and said, behold, I have dreamed a dream more and behold the sun and the moon and the 11 stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren and his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father ob observed the saying. So when we look at that picture, I think we get a clear explanation. Uh, Jacob and, and um, Rachel were the sun and moon and the 11 brothers were stars and they were bowing down to joseph his star so that was a picture of the 12 tribes of israel that is the the clear picture of what's in view here so the clothing then would indicate that the woman is the nation of israel now, one more reference to Genesis, which has significance here, too. And I want us to think about this, and that's in Genesis chapter 1. In verse 6, Genesis chapter 1, and verse 6, where we read this, and God said, let me just say, sorry, verse 16. Can't read my own writing. God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. So the sun represents supreme authority. Israel's destiny is to become the head of the nations. Sun shall rule the day. And so it has the idea of rule in view. And of course, God intended that they would be the nation that would rule the nations. That they would be the head of the nations. And so I want you just to see that for a minute. Look at Deuteronomy 28, book of Deuteronomy chapter 28, and verse 13. I'm going to look at a couple of references and that would emphasize this. Israel's prominence in world affairs, ultimately. Verse 13, it says, the Lord shall make thee, it's in Deuteronomy 28, verse 13, the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail, and thou shalt be above only, thou shalt not be beneath. If thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. So God is saying, I'm going to make you the head of the nations, not the tail. And again, connected with their compliance with the commandments of the Lord. Now look at the prophecy of Isaiah. 
a couple of scriptures, Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 3. It says, it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways he and we will walk in his paths for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So again, the, the coming exaltation of Israel as head of the nations. Gentiles will go up there saying, teach us your ways, show us your law. We're going to follow you. Look at Isaiah 60 now, just the last reference in this uh, about Israel's prominence in the latter days, and God intended them to be like the sun that rules the day. It says in verse uh, chapter 60, verse 1, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee, and the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. So all lesser authorities, like the moon, will be subject to Israel, the sun, as it were, in the last days. And of course, we're going to see ultimately that their exaltation and their they're taking their proper place is going to be connected ultimately with the man child that is described now from verse two and down including verse five so we want to look at the the woman's child now we've said that israel is the woman it says she being with child verse two travailed in birth and pain to be delivered Verse 5, she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of irons, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. So she brought forth a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Now, I want you to look with me, please, just for a second at the book of Romans, Paul's epistle to the book of to, to Romans, chapter 9, Romans chapter 9. And here we have clear evidence that this man-child came into the world through the nation of Israel. So it says in verse 4, Romans 9 verse 4, Who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises? Whose are the fathers? And of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. What a, by the way, a marvelous affirmation of both the full humanity of the Lord Jesus, who was concerning the flesh, Christ came, and then his full deity, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. And so, again, this child uh, that's going to rule all nations is brought in to the world through the nation of Israel, of whom Christ came according to the flesh. And so it says that this child was then caught up to God and his throne. And, of course, we know that that child is none other than the Lord Jesus, Israel's Messiah. His incarnation is mentioned, his ascension to the father's right hand are mentioned here as well as the fact that someday he will rule upon the earth with a rod of iron and again all of these uh, claims of his coming to rule with a rod of iron are in perfect harmony with the scriptures and again i want to just look at a few references uh, that talk about him ruling with a rod of iron psalm 2 i think is very much in the minds uh, of the um, the Lord as he uh, pens this this amazing testimony in 
in Revelation, but in Psalm 2, verse 6, it says, Yeah, have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion, and I'll declare the decree. Uh, the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. Clearly, Christ is God's plan is for him to reign from Mount Zion, the Lord Jesus, to rule with a rod of iron. And of course, Paul quotes this in Acts 13. We don't have to turn there, but verse 33, speaking again of Christ. And then perhaps one other reference uh, in Revelation itself in chapter 19. Revelation 19, verse 14 and 15, where we read this. The armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And uh, perhaps you know, let me just do one other re Old Testament reference just to kind of tie this all together, and that's in the book of Micah, the book of Micah, in the Minor Prophets, chapter 5, one we're very familiar with. It says in verse 2, it says uh, of Micah 5, verse 2, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Therefore will he give them up until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth, then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel." So, again, the woman is clearly Israel. The man-child is Christ from whom Israel came. And then, so what about the birth pangs? Well, isn't it interesting that at the time that, that Israel's Messiah was born, the nation was under Gentile dominion. And it was a time of suffering. Uh, they were under Roman rule paying a heavy burden, taxes and all the rest of it. So, so it was a time of travail. And it's interesting that even at his second advent, when he comes to reign with a rod of iron, once again, Israel will find herself in a time of travail prior to his coming, the, the time, as we're going to see in this chapter, of persecution, of difficulty. Uh, and so travail is very fitting in terms of Israel bringing forth this man-child. But Israel's future glory derives from the reign of its greatest son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So now we want to think about the red dragon. And we get some details in verse 3 and 4 here. It says there appeared another wonder. Now, I, I didn't mention this, but maybe I should. It says the, the idea of a great wonder in verse 1. And in verse 3 appeared another wonder in heaven. Uh, the word wonder is the word sign. And, and it was showing that this is clearly symbolic, but it's it's something to be taken very seriously. And so a great sign in heaven was this woman, speaking of Israel. And then here, another wonder, another sign. So again, emphasizing the symbolic nature of what we're studying. And so it says, um, there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a, a great red dragon having seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns upon his heads. So let's just kind of work through these things. First of all, the red dragon clearly is Satan. Uh, we know that because it tells us uh, in verse 9, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So not too difficult to interpret who the red dragon is. However, seven heads and ten horns are something that we have to consider here. And uh, again, we need help from other places to understand what is the significance of the seven heads and the ten horns. So let's begin with the 
the ten horns. Uh, what are the ten horns about? And again, the book of Daniel, which is, as we know, is a, a great companion book to the book of Revelation. And we'll see that more than once in our study this morning. But in Daniel chapter 7, uh, the vision of the, the nations that will exist up to the coming of Christ, um, and from a divine perspective, rather than from a human perspective, and it's the same vision we saw in chapter 2 of Daniel, where it's looking at it from man's perspective, this, this great, great image, but here from God's perspective, wild beasts. And so verse 24 of Daniel 7 says, the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. So just to get this simple point, the ten horns are ten kings who reign simultaneously with the coming world ruler, who are all going to be part of Satan's plan for the last days. So 10 kings who reign simultaneously with the coming world ruler, this beast that's going to come, Revelation 13, verse 1, 10 horns, and then the seven heads. What is the reference to the seven heads? Again, we'll get some help when we look at Revelation chapter 17. Again, letting scripture interpret scripture. Seven heads represent seven successive world empires. So look at Revelation 7 verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit in the wilderness. I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And then, as we look further down, verse 9, here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth, and there are seven kings. Now, we've already seen that, haven't we, from, from Daniel. Uh, the, the ten was ten kings, but now the seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he is cometh, he must continue a short space. So seven heads represent seven successive world kingdoms. And they're, they're all kingdoms that have been satanically influenced to persecute Israel. And he tells us five are already fallen. And at the time of writing, one is then another is not yet come. Now, let me just quickly run through this. Now, when we get to chapter 17, we'll go through it in much more detail. But there are seven historical kingdoms that have persecuted Israel with satanic influence. Five of them have already fallen. So let me go through five that have fallen. They're all, you're familiar with them. They're all on the page of scripture. Egypt was one. Assyria, the second. Babylon, the third, Medo-Persia, the fourth, Greece, the fifth, okay? Five empires, uh, kingdoms that have all been in instrumental in persecuting Israel in times gone by. One is, in John's writing, who is the persecuting power at that time? It's Rome. And then one is yet to come. It's going to be leaving it to the last days. That is going to be the revived Roman Empire of the last days. And that revived Roman Empire is certainly going to be that kingdom of the beast that we're going to see in Revelation chapter 13. So going back to the, the dragon. Satan is the dragon who is going to ultimately persecute the nation of Israel in the last days. He, I believe, will incarnate himself in the, the man of sin, just as Christ and the Father are one. So Satan and the man of sin will be presented in the same way. In fact, we're going to look next time at the satanic trinity. 
Therefore, the dragon is, is Satan incarnate, the power behind the revived Roman Empire and its ruler, the man of sin. Now, <clears throat> he's on the scene already in the book of Revelation, uh, but he it, it's only when he is uh, has a deadly wound and lives that he will demand worship and his true nature will come out, which will be at the midpoint of the tribulation. And we'll see that more when we get into chapter 13. But I want you to notice now he's going back in history a little bit. He's looking forward to this last day uh, when he comes, but now he's going to go back and he says in verse four, his tail, speaking of this dragon, drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So the dragon drew one third of the stars from heaven. This is no doubt a description of the original fall of Satan, at which time a third of the angels fell with him. Now, what is interesting, at least to me, is that scripture has always indicated that the devil has angels that are under his control. In fact, Matthew 25, verse 41, where I'm sure very familiar with this scripture, talks about the devil and his angels. It talks about the, the ultimate end of them, but it says in Matthew 25, verse 41, then shall he say also to them on the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So we knew the devil had angels, but it's not till we get to Revelation chapter 12 that we find out just how many. We know there's quite a few, but what we do know is that one third of all the angels fell or sided with the devil when he fell, which means two thirds stayed loyal to God, what we call the elect angels. And it's a, just an interesting thought, isn't it? Uh, that here's another example of Satan's failures. He, he wanted to overthrow God, but he was only successful in a measure to bring a third with him. But two third did not follow his lead and stayed loyal to God. So again, we see something of his failings. Now, we, we're not going to take a lot of time, but we just want to mention that when we read about the fall of Satan, the key passages that we need to consider is Ezekiel 28. And maybe we'll just, they're, they're short passages, easy to read them. So it'd be good just to take a minute to do that. Um, Ezekiel uh, chapter 28, verse 13 through 15, where we read these words. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. This is verse 13 of Ezekiel 28. Uh, the sardius, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was cre created till iniquity was found in thee. And again, important scripture. God didn't make the devil. He made Lucifer, but Lucifer, like all of us, had a free will, and he chose to rebel against God and therefore um, managed to uh, also bring with him a third of the angels. What uh, Isaiah 14 now, please, just another passage that gives some light on this. Uh, it was he became corrupted because of his beauty, proud of his beauty. In verse 12, how art thou fallen from heaven? This is Isaiah 14, verse 12. O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend upon the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. 
And so what we see is pride was the satanic sin. He he wasn't content being this anointed cherub in the very presence of God, great place of privilege. But he was corrupted because of his beauty, and he thought, I am so special, I am so beautiful, I should be worshipped like God. And he wanted God's place. All relevant, because we're going to see that that the thing that he's always wanted, he's finally going to get when we get to Revelation 13. He is going to be worshipped through the, the, the beast, uh, the man of sin. And so he's going to get his dream. And uh, But it'll be very short-lived. Now, just this idea of bringing a third of the stars, just so we know that stars is referring to angels. Again, it's symbolic language, but the book of Job, chapter 38, tells us what is going on here gives an indication that it's actually speaking of angelic beings. And this is uh, God's creation. Obviously, he created the angelic realms uh, prior to the general creation. And it says in verse 7, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. And so they witnessed creation. So he managed to bring a third of the stars with them and yet as we said two-thirds stayed loyal to god that's why in scripture it's good to remind ourselves there are more with us than there are against us and even if it wasn't the case god is still more powerful than all of the hordes of satan anyway and if god before you who can who can be against you but Notice the objective of the dragon, again, in our passage here. It says in verse 4, His tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, did cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So what we, we see here is this, that Satan's passion was to prevent messiah the messiah coming in the first place <laughs> and so we we see historically attempts to, to destroy the royal seed and so and, and there were times when it got perilously close to destroying the royal seed of whom the promised messiah would come in the old testament he fought desperately to prevent the messiah from being born uh corrupting the race in Genesis chapter 6 so that the messianic, messianic line would be corrupted. And, and that was part of his attempt, I think, in Genesis 6, that, that terrible event. But then at times, for instance, in the days of wicked Queen Athaliah, remember the whole uh, Davidic dynasty hung by one tiny thread. <laughs> and, and, and so, uh, but now the man-child is born, immediately he saw its dis his destruction. And of course, we know the story well, Matthew's gospel and chapter two, using again a puppet king, Herod, who didn't want to lose his place, pride of position, Matthew 2, 16, when the scribes and Pharisees saw him, uh, that's Mark chapter 2, verse 16. That's why it doesn't sound right. Matthew 2 and verse 16. It says, here we are. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked to the wise men, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all the course thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. And again, we want to just emphasize, Satan's a loser. He failed. <laughs> he failed in his attempts to wipe out the Messiah at his birth. And so here he is. He came to devour her child as soon as it was born, and yet he failed. And I want us to get this. If we don't get anything else this morning, get this idea that Satan is failing at every level. He only manages to bring a third with him. He fails to bring the majority with him. He fails in his attempts to destroy the man-child at his birth. And now verse 6, it says, 
and the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. Now we make rapid movement through time from the birth of the man child. It's then caught up to God, or he's then caught up to God in his throne. And now we find ourselves in the second half of the tribulation period. It's amazing how we're just kind of scanning the ages here as we go through this chapter. And again, what we're seeing is Satan's hatred and opposition to God and his people is undiminished through time. It was there when Christ was born. It's there in the last days. Uh, he's still uh, hopping mad, seeking uh, to cause destruction. He is a destroyer. And so he now he is trying to persecute the woman. The woman Israel, it says, fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God for her, and there that she should feed her, that they should they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. So the woman, which is Israel, fled to the wilderness, and she has a place prepared for her for one thousand two hundred and sixty days, which is three and a half years, based on the Jewish calculation of a year, which is three hundred and sixty day year, not a three hundred and sixty five day year. That gives us three and a half years. And so it says that she's she has a place prepared. We'll think about that in a moment. But also um, she flees into the wilderness where this place is prepared for her, that they should feed her. So some group other than Israel is going to feed and protect Israel during this time. Let me make a couple of suggestions. Remember that great passage in Matthew 25 where it talks about the things that people had done to the least of his brethren? Uh, great passage, Matthew 25, uh, where uh, the judgment of the living nations, and they have shown that they believe in Israel's Messiah by caring for his brethren. When I was in prison, you visited me. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. Hey, well, when did you do that? I believe that it's going to be in the tribulation period that righteous Gentiles, just like righteous Gentiles during the Holocaust, helped protect many Israel Israelis and, and preserve them. Uh, the great story of the Vichy France and how the Jews headed to the Derby communities, the Derbyist churches, because they knew they loved Israel and many of them were saved by staying in the homes of the Darbyists. Well, they're going to be sympathizers uh, of Israel at this time. They are going to feed Israel. And what is that place? Now, again, there's a lot of conjecture about it. But many have thought that the place prepared in the wilderness is none other than Petra, the city in the rock. In fact, some have been so convinced of this uh, one famous prophecy preacher of a former generation who had a classic book long before the late great planet Earth or some of the more uh, left behind series, a man called W.E. Blackstone. He lived at October 6, 1841 to November 7th, 7, 1935. He wrote a classic book on prophecy called Jesus is Coming, and he left boxes of them hidden in caves in Petra thinking that the Jews would flee there in the tribulation period. Others have stored food there, uh, expecting that that's where the Jews are going to run and hide. We can't be definitive or dogmatic about that, but there is a place that God has prepared for that nation, and they will flee there. And of course, they, what's, at what point are they going to flee? Well, it's when, we'll see it in Revelation 13, but in Matthew 24, the signal to flee is going to be clear to them. In Matthew 24, we're going to break in. In verse 15, it says this, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. 
Then let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. Them that is in the housetop not come down, take anything in, out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Woe to him that are with child and them that give suck in those days. Pray your flight be not on the, in the winter, neither in the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to, the, uh, to this time. No, nor shall, ever shall be. And so, again, I believe that when they see the abomination, which will be at the midpoint of the tribulation, when this beast, uh, according to the false prophet, they're going to build an image of the beast. It's going to have life. Uh, and at that point, it's going to be in the temple of God. That's when the, t the signal for them to flee. Now, war in heaven. There's so much in this chapter, it's amazing. I'm not sure we're going to even finish it today. But anyway, war in heaven, verse 7. It says, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven, and the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So, war in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon fought, and his angels saw a tremendous battle in the, the angelic realms. Now, we, we know that although Satan has fallen and been cast to the earth, he and his angels still, to this very hour, have access to heaven. How do we know that? Well, the book of Job and the first two chapters gives us a description of that. You remember they go and they present themselves before the Lord, and the Lord says, have you considered my serpent, servant Job? And so there's this dialogue about Job and and all the rest of it. We also know that that one of his chief purposes for going there is as the accuser of the brethren. When we studied Zechariah, we saw when Joshua the high priest, after coming from Babylon, was was getting ready to begin his high priestly service. Uh, Satan drew near and basically said, how can you use a dirty priest? This guy's defiled from Babylon. And, and so he's the accuser of the brethren. That's found in Zechariah 3, verses 1 and 2. He's always there as the accuser of the saints before God's throne. Now, some have asked, well, how could that be? How could, you know, if heaven, you know, God can't look upon iniquity and, you know, heaven's a whole, how could the devil have access when he is so evil? And just one, perhaps, suggestion that may help us, that how, how this can actually happen. And I want you to go back to the book of Exodus in chapter 14, just to give a suggestion. And again, I'm not being dogmatic about this, but I wonder if this is the picture that God wants us to see. Exodus 14, verse 19 and 20 let me just read. It says, and the angel of God. Let me see. What chapter did I say? <clears throat> Exodus 14. Yeah. Um, and the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians in the camp of Israel, and it was a cloud and darkness to them, but it gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all the night. And so you get the picture that here's Pharaoh and his armies, they're hotly pursuing Israel, and the 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 Shekinah glory and the angel of his presence come between them. And there's a beautiful shining of, of glory on the nation of Israel. On the other hand, there's thick darkness on Pharaoh and his armies. So could it be that when Satan comes to accuse the brethren, there's this protection of God's Shekinah, darkness 
for for devil and his angels and then glorious light for the children of god and so that's just a suggestion of how that might work because some people have difficulty with that idea now just another quick thought before we'll have to wrap up here but um i want to think about michael um, because he definitely has significance in the last days look at daniel chapter 12 daniel chapter 12 and verse 1 it says, and at that time, this is speaking of the time of the last days. It says, at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And so, again, that shows Michael's significance for the end times. And here he is. Now, of course, he knows something about warfare. He's he, he's already had a few run-ins. Daniel chapter 10, there was a big conflict uh, in re response to Daniel's prayer. And Michael came to the assistance of Gabriel in, a, in an almighty battle. Uh, Jude 9, he's disputed about the body of Moses. Uh, with Satan. So they are, they've already had some run-ins, but uh, this is the ultimate battle. And Michael uh, is going to cast Satan and his angels out. And our clock has beaten us and we'll have to stop there. But <laughs> uh, just be encouraged, brethren, that Satan's a loser and the Lord is the winner. Amen. <laughs>